As the number of COVID-19 cases tops 100 million around the world, we will take a look at vaccination efforts. What can be done to speed up the process? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. Vaccines are considered the best weapon to fight the pandemic. U.S. President Joe Biden is promising to ramp up efforts. He promised to have nearly the entire United States population vaccinated by September. The United States has recorded one out of every four confirmed COVID-19 cases around the world. In the United Kingdom, the number of coronavirus-related deaths has reached 100,000. Fearing the spread of the variant in the UK, European countries stepped up security protocols. The Netherlands imposed a curfew for the first time since World War II, which has led to violent protests against the lockdown. To take a closer look at vaccination efforts in Europe, let's bring in our first panel from Paris via Skype. Maria Paola Cavallo is a journalist and author, and from Moscow, also via Skype, Konstantin Severinov is the principal investigator at Waxman Institute of Microbiology and a consultant to the Russian government. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Konstantin, let me start with you and look at the vaccination program in Russia. Russia, of course, has a fully domestic, fully state-financed uh, vaccination program. Up to now, just over a million people have been vaccinated in the country. What can you tell us about the COVID-19 situation in Russia and the vaccination rollout? Well, presently, Russia ranks for the fourth in the world in terms of the number of documented cases after the United States, um, India, and Brazil. Um, so the number of deaths right now is recorded at about 70,000 people, which is less than the UK that you mentioned. Um, the, these are official numbers, so the reality is probably uh, not as... If you can consider this as good, then reality is probably... Uh, four times higher in terms of the numbers of both deaths and and the cases. Uh, at the population of 145 million people, if you look at the proportion of people who were infected, Russia is probably second. So uh, these are obviously bad news. And so there are three vaccines which have been developed domestically. They have different principles of action. And at least one of them is now has been rolled out starting early December. And it's now freely available, at least in Moscow, to everyone who is above 18. So uh, I said that just over a million people had been vaccinated in Russia. That's mainly in the cities, uh, Konstantin. What about the other parts of the country? This is very hard to tell. I mean, this is such a large country. Uh, I mean, they have what's called regions or oblasts, which are akin to the states in the USA. So these are being provided with a certain amount of doses which are primarily being used to vaccinate uh, people who are either medical professionals or teachers and the like. Moscow, the Moscow government had underwritten the clinical trials of the most advanced, the so-called Sputnik or Gamaleya vaccine. And as a result of that, they ensured a vast supply of vaccines for their city. And now this is being given three, three in, in, in Moscow. Maria, let's look at the European Union. The EU now wants all European-produced vaccines to remain within the borders of the European Union. Uh, Bloomberg News reports that 9 million Europeans have been vaccinated so far. That is, in fact, a very low number if you look at that compared to the number of people proportionally who have been vaccinated in the United States, for that matter, or in the United Kingdom. What is your assessment of the situation in Europe? Yeah, that's true. While Britain has vaccinated 10% of its population, things are a bit slower here in France, where 1.2 million people have been vaccinated since the end of December. After having received a lot of criticism by the slow pace of its campaign, the French government has a plan to vaccinate 70 million people, that is to say the entire population, by the end of August. As other European countries, France is giving priority to those at risk, people aged 75 and over, and health workers over 50. They just need to make an appointment. However, France is far behind other neighbors as Italy, Spain, and Germany. And a key point is the number of doses available. 
Uh, one should remember that the European Commission has ordered, uh, has coordinated the orders to all its uh, members based on the size of their population. But recently, two drug uh, companies just uh, informed Europe that they were they had the problems with the supplies. So there is a great frustration here in Europe at this moment with the, the delays and uh, all the vaccination schedule has to be changed. And this episode just shows how much the European Union is dependent on others. Of course, the authorities here asked these um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, among them AstraZeneca, to offer more transparency and to honor their obligations. It's important to say that the European Union has invested 3 billion euros to accelerate the development of these vaccines, and now is determined to get some value for that money. Constantine, uh, we are hearing about variants of this virus. We hear about the South African variant, the United Kingdom variant. There's a variant in Brazil as well. Uh, these variants are believed to spread far quicker than the original virus. What can you tell us about them, and are they in any way resistant to the current vaccines? Well, uh, none of the variants which have been reported uh, will be resistant to the action of vaccines. That being said, uh, they may be attenuated, meaning that the antibodies which are developed as a result of vaccination with any vaccine which is now on the market may be slightly less efficient in curing the mutated viruses. However, uh, this effect should not be detrimental, at least not yet, because uh, each of these vaccines elicits such a strong immune response that there will be enough room there. Uh, to take care even of the viruses which are less efficiently recognized. Maria, of course, uh, the rollout of vaccinations is one thing, but what is Europe doing as a whole to stop the spread uh, of the virus? You know, I know there are lockdowns, there are new lockdowns, really, in uh, the United Kingdom, as well in the, as in the Netherlands, where there have been some demonstrations. But what is the EU doing as a whole? Yeah. Although the vaccination campaigns, the European governments are desperate to curb the spread of the coronavirus and to control the circulation of the three mutations appeared in Brazil, South Africa and in the United Kingdom. Uh, many countries are reinforcing protective measures. This includes a first curfew uh, in Netherlands since the Second World War, but the new restrictions provoked three days of violent riots with protesting clashes between uh, the police. Uh, many, set, uh, many cars and bikes, uh, were, they put fire on them. And uh, also there, is, there were manifestations in Amsterdam, Eindhoven, Rotterdam. 400 people were detained by the police. And here in France, we have uh, curfew 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., but it might not be uh, enough as the authorities are increasingly concerned about the UK variant, which is reported to be more dangerous and more, um, how can I say, more contagious. Uh, so this represents already 10 percent of the total cases in France, 15 percent of the total cases in Paris, and it may become the dominant virus by March if nothing has done to stop it. Konstantin, uh, I was reading a report in the Moscow Times which says that uh, authorities in Russia have lifted some of the restrictions that were first put in place as cases in the country continue to recede. But, uh, I mean, what do you see in a place like Moscow? Are offices, restaurants, cultural centers, are they reopening or do they remain closed? Well, in Moscow, restaurants were never closed. So there was a curfew, and we call it this way. That is that restaurants were to be closed by 11 p.m., right? Uh, and uh, But right now, the number of cases in Russia, official cases, went down from the high, the high of 28,000 daily to 18,000 today, actually less than that. And so, again, at least in Moscow, many of the measures uh, are now being um, becoming less strict. So as of uh, 
I believe today the restaurants can be open 24 hours a day. There were some restrictions for uh, the use of uh, the uh, public transportation, uh, which again is now uh, being lessened. So, so uh, I, I don't know, this may be a wishful thinking, but it almost looks like people are eager to, uh, to stop these measures because they feel that they may have overreacted during the long New Year's holidays, which in Russia are uh, mm -hmm. going on for two weeks. And there was general feeling that there may be a surge of infections after the holidays are over, but this didn't happen. Maria, what about travel within the uh, countries of the European Union? Are people allowed to move around freely or are there restrictions? Well, the European countries are working together to diminish the infections and they discourage traveling and some of them are implementing tougher border rules. For example, today, uh, Belgium has banned all non-essential foreign travels. Here in France, if you arrive by plane, you are supposed to show a negative COVID-19 test before arriving in the territory, including those coming from other European Union countries. But it's important to say that France is considering to impose a third uh, national lockdown, as the cases have been rising steadily since the end of November. The average of new contaminations today is around 20,000 per day. It's much more than the 5,000 uh, predicted or hoped by the French President Emmanuel Macron uh, in December. Of course, the government is concerned about the economic impact of a new lockdown, which could cost, according to the government figures, 15 billion uh, euros per month. Okay, Maria Constantine, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Let's shift our focus now to the Americas. From Sao Paulo, Gustavo Ribeiro is the founder of Brazilian Report. Benjamin Newman is a professor of biological sciences at Texas A&M University. He joins us from College Station in Texas. And here in Washington, D.C., Joseph Williams is a senior editor for U.S. News and World Report. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Benjamin, uh, here in the United States, President Biden has announced what is a pretty ambitious uh, vaccination program. He wants to vaccinate all Americans by the end of the summer. That's, of course, the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. That's more than 300 million people. But given the problems that we've seen so far, logistical problems, supply problems, uh, is that achievable? I think there are certainly several problems here. And the things that we've seen in the Netherlands with the riots and in the Soviet Union with just, uh, or Russia rather, with just people's feeling that this ought to be over is very much echoed in some parts of the United States, I think. Um, and so I believe the problem is more a political one than one of sheer logistics. So I believe the logistical problems can be solved, but the idea of convincing enough people to take the vaccine and uh, that this is essentially our best chance of getting out of this situation, that remains to be done, and that, I believe, remains the main challenge here. Uh, right, Benjamin, you know, you mentioned uh, that uh, there could be what we've heard, this term we've heard called... Uh, fatigue, uh, the vaccine, enough, uh, the program fatigue that we see right now. Uh, do you think that could happen in the United States? Because we see now it's manifested itself in some of the countries in Europe. Yes, just uh, speaking for this part of Texas, uh, fatigue is here and, uh, yeah, very, very apparent. Um, most places, even where there are enhanced restrictions, you will see businesses and individuals not uh, following the restrictions. And there's also been a considerable pushback from local police forces, uh, in some cases uh, saying that they would refuse to enforce uh, any restrictions if they did come in. So in general, you have some people, some part of the population following the recommendations, others not following it, and a very large number of cases of COVID-19 as a result of this. Joseph Williams, the United States has vaccinated 23 million people. That's more than any other country has vaccinated. But behind these numbers, uh, there is a story of gross unfairness and inequality. Uh, according to CNN, inoculations are twice as high among whites in America as they are among African Americans and Latinos. Yet, you know, if we look at the figures, African Americans and Latinos are dying uh, from COVID at three times the rate of white Americans. What's going on here? 
Uh, what's going on is a dual kind of problem. The first problem is uh, with the rollout. Uh, under the Trump administration, the rollout was not anything close to being smooth. There were places that got a large amount of vaccines. There were other places that didn't. There were places that didn't know whether or not they were going to get the vaccine at all and when it might come. And as you know, this is a per perishable uh, vaccine that is very, very sensitive to warm. And, and there were a couple of situations where these vaccines were spoiled because they didn't get to where they needed to go on time. The second problem that we have here is that African Americans and Latinos tend to distrust the government, particularly when it comes to medical situations. Again, everybody knows about the Tuskegee experiment and about the problems that African Americans and Latinos have had getting fair treatment and getting access to treatment. So those twin problems, logistics of getting the virus out the door and the problem with trust among minorities of the, of the federal government, run smack into the problem of uh, people who were who, you know, white people in, in certain cities that were willing and able to take, take the virus and were going to snap up the doses that the African Americans and Latinos that the minorities did not want. So in several cities, DC among them, you have uh, uh, white, white people cutting lines mm -hmm. to get the vaccine where African Americans, Latinos, their communities are, are hit hardest. There is some starting to come around with some of the trust. Some, some minorities are starting to trust the government a little bit more now that Biden is in control. Uh, trust in government and polls has ticked up. So more minorities are willing to get the vaccine. But even those who wanted to get the vaccine were unsure where they could get it. They were unsure if they could cut in line. There was an access problem in terms of registering for the vaccine because some people don't have internet and phone registration lines were clogged. So it has been a logistical nightmare to try to get the vaccine to people who want it on top of a problem of having to convince them that this is good and that the government is here to help. Right, just on the logistical problem, uh, Joseph, is that getting better? Is that getting fixed right now? Well, it's, it's a far way from getting fixed. Uh, certainly, President Biden has a plan, and that's a first step. Uh, President Trump didn't seem to have a plan going out the door, and the incoming administration famously said that there was nothing left in the cupboard, nothing in the binder, nothing to tell them how to get this done. So they had to come up with a plan themselves. So rollout is still going to be sticky. We still have these problems of people wanting the vaccine, states and cities wanting the vaccine, but can't getting it because there is not enough supply to meet the demand. So it is a big logistical challenge. We will see if the administration is up to it. So far, they seem to be off to a reasonable, reasonable start, but people are still dying by the day, and that's not a good sign. All right, let's go to Sao Paulo and see what the situation is like in Brazil. Gustavo, great to have you with us. Uh, Brazil, of course, is facing a major challenge from this virus, and there is a variant in the country as well. What is the situation in the country, and what can you tell us about the efforts to get the vaccine out? Well, Brazil is undergoing a second wave of coronavirus infections. Since November, we are seeing uh, infections and deaths, daily deaths skyrocket in Brazil. Uh, the end of the year holidays did not help because millions of Brazilians disrespected social isolation recommendations and partied uh, without any of the the, the recommendations for social isolation or the use of face masks. And now we're paying the toll and we're seeing uh, the numbers simply uh, out of the charts uh, in many regions in Brazil. The worst problems here right now are in the Amazon region. The biggest city in the Amazon, Manaus, is under a second collapse. The, the, the local network of hospitals collapsed around March 2020 and now it's collapsing again, thanks in large part to a new variant that is highly transmissible, mm -hmm. even if it's not as deadly as the first variant of the virus. And now uh, the, the problem is Manaus is connected to the rest of Brazil, mainly through airways. And uh, we are starting to identify cases of this new variant in other areas of the country. And that means that maybe it was uh, transmitted in airports so that we could see a rise in infections of this new variant uh, all over the, the map here. Uh, and uh, in terms of the vaccination, Brazil has vaccinated almost one million people. Rollout started uh, last week 
And uh, we are already seeing bumps uh, with uh, the rollout process because many uh, states are already reporting the lack of inputs. And uh, because of Brazil's troubled relations with uh, other countries, notably uh, China and India, there is a lot of uncertainty if the, we're going to see uh, uh, delays and even if uh, the vaccination effort will have to be suspended for uh, maybe 30, 40 days in order to get inputs in time in order to produce more vaccines locally. Right, Gustavo, talking about the vaccination program in Brazil, what about those areas that you talked about earlier on in the Amazon? I mean, are they able to get vaccines into these areas? Well, every single state in Brazil has already had uh, the vaccination started, but of course numbers are not the same. In a, in a couple of Amazonian states, we have yet to reach the 1,000 people mark. Uh, rollouts are very uh, uh, slow in those areas because of logistical issues uh, and because of the fact that uh, so far regulators have only greenlit 8, eight million uh, doses. Uh, so that's not even enough for the first stage of the vaccination effort. We would need 14 million doses. Uh, and uh, especially in these areas, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty of how this vaccination effort will continue. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there, there's a lot of feud between the federal government, state governments. Yeah. So at this point, nobody knows. And uh, for instance, economists are already lowering their expectations for the Brazilian economy because we will not be able to meet the vaccination goals. All right, Benjamin, President Biden has moved very quickly to bar travelers from certain countries, especially countries with the variant, from coming to the United States. Uh, he's barred travelers from South Africa, from Brazil, but there's also the variant in the United Kingdom. Uh, what Will these travel bans help? I think that's fairly unlikely. So right now, a lot of these variants are popping up in places where people are doing sequencing, which is how you read out the genome and figure out exactly what you have. And it's not because the viruses are necessarily only in those places. It's just that those are the places that we are actually doing the test that would detect whether or not a particular variant is there. The normal COVID tests are absolutely uh, blind. They can't tell one strain from another strain. And in the U.S. in particular, it's been fairly slow going actually getting uh, some of these sequencing done. Places like the U.K. have turned in something like 40 percent of all the COVID sequences in the world. And uh, yeah, the U.S. proportionately is really lagging behind. So to some extent, I think it is most likely that these uh, variants are already much more widely distributed and in some cases are already in the United States. And in that sense, a travel ban wouldn't have any effect, at least when it's targeted in the way that they are talking about. I think in general, uh, having restrictions on travel, such as a quarantine and a negative test, will be useful everywhere in preventing the spread of this virus and in keeping virus numbers down when we finally manage to get a handle on this. But no, I don't think this uh, particular policy will achieve its stated goal in a direct way. Uh, Joseph, uh, talking about South Africa, where we have that one variant, uh, South Africa, of course, has been hard hit by this pandemic as well. Uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, he addressed the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos. It was a virtual address to the forum this week. And he focused on one issue, and that is about the global distribution of vaccines. Let's listen to what he had to say. And some countries have even gone beyond and acquired up to four times what their population needs. And that was aimed at hoarding these vaccines. And now this is being done to the exclusion of countries, of other countries in the world that most need this. So Joseph, some have called this vaccine nationalism, um, but could developing countries lose out in the end or will it take a much longer time for them to recover? Uh, I think the answer to both of those questions is yes and yes. Uh, they are very real risk of losing out, mainly because wealthy countries were the ones who developed the vaccine and they are claiming first dibs. The problem that we have here is that distribution is unequal. We don't have these uh, poor states that can afford to buy the vaccine at these retail prices that are for the vaccine first rolling, up, rolling out of the factory. So some uh, 
price cushioning has to happen, either forgiveness of debt or granting them the vaccine free of charge. And I'll tell you why that makes sense for richer companies, because no one is safe from the virus unless everyone is safe from the virus. We're a truly, truly global society. Travel is international. You can go from here to Dubai uh, on a moment's notice if you wanted to. So people are moving around the globe all the time. And the, the fact that the virus came from Wuhan to the United States and swept through in a matter of weeks indicates the fact that everyone needs to get vaccinated. So it's in the U.S.'s best interest to provide some vaccines for these, for these uh, poorer nations. However, that runs smack into a political problem that uh, President Biden would have if he deigned to make a public announcement that he was doing this. And that would become a lot of people, a lot of uh, voters would be upset and feel that they're giving their vaccines away when they should have preference. So vaccine nationalism is a thing. It's going to be a thing for a while, I believe. And it will probably be to the peril of poorer countries and thus in turn to the peril of richer countries like the U.S. Right. Uh, Gustavo, the initial Brazilian vaccine uh, strategy was to manufacture the AstraZeneca virus locally in Brazil. And it was hoped that that would produce about 100 million uh, doses. But that uh, effort has been hit by delays and there have been other problems. It didn't yield any of those doses. Um, what happened? Well, we don't have enough uh, uh, inputs to produce the vaccines. The, the federal government has also uh, been very slow in trying to negotiate how this production will uh, be carried out. Uh, and uh, the government has also faced harsh criticism because it put uh, it bet only on the AstraZeneca vaccine. It has turned down an offer from Pfizer for 70 million shots. It had the President Bolsonaro has been an outspoken critic of the CoronaVac by uh, Sinovac. And uh, now that uh, public opinion is rallying behind the vaccine, and we have almost 80% of Brazilians who want to vaccinate as soon as possible, the government is trying to do a U turn and uh, uh, go away uh, from its anti vax stance and try essentially to gaslight the public into saying that they have always been pro-vaccine and that they will try uh, to get as many vaccines as possible. But uh, the truth is that uh, the Brazilian government has been extremely slow into start negotiations right. and into preparing its infrastructure for uh, different kinds of vaccines. Benjamin, very quickly, I've got uh, about 30 seconds. The governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, is thinking of uh, lifting restrictions. He wants to allow indoor dining soon, 25% of capacity. Um, is that premature? I think that's quite premature. And in places like Texas, where we've seen this sort of thing happen, we have seen cases start to rise about two weeks after, just like clockwork. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Vinder in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.